as you can see there on the first slide, uh, the title for my talk is actually taken from our reading today, Isaiah 10, verse 7. And although, of course, the reading is all about Assyria, Assyria uh, unquestionably in the Old Testament scriptures is a type of the modern-day Gog. So uh, what is applicable for Assyria is applicable for Gog today. Now, what about Russia? I uh, thought about this and I thought some comments made by Winston Churchill um, over half a century ago are still applicable today. I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia. It is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. But perhaps there is a key, and that key is Russian national interest. And uh, we've certainly seen that happen this year over the last few months. So what about Ukraine? Um, there it is sitting in the right in the middle between the Russian Federation on the east and the European Union on the west. Uh, for a long time, Ukraine has been pulled in both directions and no one really knows where they were going to end up. One person had some fears and that was John McCain who a short time ago actually ran for the presidency of the United States. Vladimir Putin wants the restoration of the Russian Empire of which Ukraine is the crown jewel. I'm very worried about what actions after the Olympics, that is in February this year, that Putin may take in order to ensure that John, ensure that, sorry, John McCain, US Senator. And it's, it's interesting to note, brothers and sisters, that Russia was originally called Rus, and the very first Rus state was in fact Kiev, which is the capital of Ukraine. So you can see that the Russians have a great interest in Ukraine, and particularly Vladimir Putin. Now, what happened in Ukraine? Well, in February this year, Ukraine's president flees the country after three months of riots and disturbances in that small country. And that was because originally the president was going to sign an agreement whereby he would pull Ukraine more over into the EU bloc, and then suddenly, under pressure from Russia, he changed his mind and said, I'm not going to sign it. Well, that immediately caused a lot of protests and riots in the country, and as a consequence, he fled the country. And a provisional pro-European, pro-EU government was put in its place. Um, what does Putin think about Ukraine? See that map there? All those countries listed... All of those countries there were once part of the USSR. With the collapse of the USSR in 1991, she lost the whole lot of them. And one of the principal countries that Russia lost was the country of Ukraine. And as far as Putin is concerned, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. So do you think he's happy about losing all those countries? And you think he's happy about losing that country of Ukraine which sits right in the middle of the Eastern and Western Bloc. Well, we know what happened, of course. Um, Putin didn't wait very long. When he could see that things weren't going his way, he decided to grab uh, Crimea. He thought to himself, well, if I can't get the whole country at once, at least I'll take a chunk of it down the bottom. And in the matter of a few weeks, Crimea disappeared from the map of Ukraine. Now, that's an incredible thing to think about. Here you've got an independent, sovereign country. Suddenly, without any warning, Russia just moves in with her troops, takes over the country, and within a matter of weeks, signs a decree that Crimea no longer exists as part of Ukraine. It now exists as part of the Russian Federation. And so the Russian bear made sure that they were quick in biting off that little chunk. In May this year... Um, a Western-leaning president by the name of Poroshenko won the Ukrainian presidential election. And again, that immediately caused ripples and disturbances in the mind of the Russian hierarchy, and in particular, Vladimir Putin, because here you've got a president legitimately elected as head of the Ukraine state. He has leanings towards the EU, so what was going to happen to the total country of the uh, Ukraine, including the eastern section, which Russia would dearly like to have for herself? 
So again, the tensions were beginning to rise. Then in July this year, we had the Malaysian MH17 shot down. Now, ostensibly, brothers and sisters, it was shot down, of course, by the Ukraine rebels, but everyone seems to know who really shot it down. Putin is daring the US and the EU to stop him. Sanctions, capital flight, recession. He's demonstrating that these are a price he's prepared to pay. Putin is determined not to allow the MH17 incident to interfere with his plan for domination. And that was uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald only uh, a few weeks ago. So we can see the sort of things that are happening now on the bigger scale. What is really uh, the desire of Russia? Our title this afternoon is Russia's Desire. I'd like to throw up to you in the first part of uh, the talk this afternoon to outline for you just what Russia is really up to, as far as we can determine, bearing in mind Winston Churchill's comments. Then we're going to have a look at what the scripture has to say to outline for us the final picture. So Russia's desire. What is Vladimir Putin really up to in Ukraine? Why is he willing to take the kinds of risks that produce the destruction of a civilian airliner? The US and its allies should see his power play as an effort to alter, and this is important to notice this, in his effort to alter not just the arc of Ukraine, but all of Europe. I think Russia's goal is a weak and divided Ukraine and a bigger goal is a weak and divided Europe. And that, brothers and sisters, is what we would expect to see, wouldn't we? We know from uh, Ezekiel 38 that Russia will be in control of a vast tract of territory sweeping right across both East and Western Europe. And uh, it's in Russia's interests to keep the Western European nations in a state of weakness and uncertainty. And that certainly is the desire of Vladimir Putin. Well, what about the response from the Western nations? Obama has boasted about the efficacy of his post-Crimea sanctions, but so far they've had little impact on the Russian economy and even less on the Kremlin's behaviour, save perhaps to underscore how reluctant the West is to punish the Kremlin. So you've got the leader of the free Western world nations in Barack Obama, the president of the US. What is he doing? We would have thought that there would have been a far greater response from that president. But all he keeps talking about is sanctions. And we'll see in a moment in the light, in the light of the recent events this week that uh, the president of the USA has even come out and definitively stated that he does not intend to take Russia on militarily. Well, once you say that to the Russian bear, it more or less gives them a carte blanche uh, opportunity to keep going the way they have been going. Now, look at the strategic position of Ukraine as far as Europe is concerned. If they were to impose tougher sanctions, what would Vladimir Putin do? Could he retaliate by closing off the gas taps? One third of Europe's gas comes from Russia, and about half of that gas flows through Ukraine. Four of the EU member states get literally all their gas from Russia, and another 12 rely on Russia for more than half their supply. And Ukraine, sitting there in the middle of the European continent, is the world's largest transit country for energy. Now that's something to think about. There is Ukraine sitting there right in the middle, and no wonder John McCain expressed the view that, as far as Russia is concerned, Ukraine is the jewel in the crown. If they can get that country totally, they effectively, for the foreseeable future, are going to be in a position to dominate Europe. Now, what's happened in the last week? Well, the president of Ukraine met Vladimir Putin, and there they are at the meeting. They reluctantly shook hands. And the president of Ukraine said this, the fate of Europe and the world rests on the talks. But at the same time as those talks are being conducted and Vladimir Putin is giving assurances, sort of, that he will do everything in his power to bring some respite to the unease in Ukraine, we find that rebels in East Ukraine had seized swathes of territory from retreating government forces as the tide turns again 
in the four-month conflict, prompting Kiev to call upon the NATO countries for help. And if that wasn't sufficient to ring alarm bells amongst the world's statesmen, we had the news only in the last couple of days that Russia, brothers and sisters, has in fact invaded Ukraine. Now that is a startling development. They've already taken Crimea. There's no question that Vladimir Putin would like to take the rest of Ukraine. Now he's actually sent his forces into Ukraine. Now admittedly, at this stage, there's not a lot of them. But you know, there are 20,000 Russian forces sitting there on the border of East Ukraine and Russia, just twiddling their thumbs, waiting for the order. Ukraine, because of that action, demands EU military assistance as Russia invades. Russian troops are actively involved, tearing apart the east of the country, raising fears of a direct military confrontation between Kiev and Russia. And Obama's response, he said, we have ruled out a American military action. And in today's paper we read, the latest Russian manoeuvres are sparking fears that Moscow is seeking more than Crimea. So that just puts you in the picture as to what is happening in Ukraine, and we can see the very sinister, subtle moves of Vladimir Putin and the Russian people in the broader sense. Now I'm going to move on down to the Middle East just briefly, because in the Middle East there's been this startling development of a jihadist uh, Sunni Muslim force known as originally ISIS, and now it's just called IS, the Islamic State. They have formed a caliphate, and uh, the word caliph comes from the Arabic, and it means successor. And these, uh, these jihadist Sunni Muslims believe that they are the only legitimate successors to the original force of the uh, Muslims established by Muhammad way back in the 600s um, AD. And they believe that their leader, Baghdadi, is in fact the only legitimate successor to Muhammad. So in order to achieve the great swath of territory that they are attempting to overcome, they are going through Iraq and Syria and killing by barbarous means anyone who stands in their way. And those barbarous means include beheading, burning alive, burying people alive, crucifixion. Whatever means they can think of, they will destroy their enemies. And no wonder the economist said, terror's new headquarters. Now, how are they going to be stopped? Well, admittedly, the US, rather belatedly, together with Great Britain and perhaps Australia, are thinking about and have already started uh, bombing flights over the uh, territory occupied by the IS. But you know, there's another power also that's uh, waiting there in the wings. And Russia has extended its influence in the Middle East. It is highly significant that Iran and Russia have announced that they would jointly help Iraq combat the ISIS terrorism in the country. So whilst it is true that the USA is attempting to do something, President Obama has made it very clear that he has no intention whatsoever of committing forces on the ground in uh, Iraq or Syria. Now, Russia has already provided Iraq with uh, warplanes and bombers in order to take on the ISIS terrorists, but who knows what else Russia has up her sleeve. But Obama desperately wants to get out of the Middle East. It offers nothing but misery to any US president. Any US action produces a hostile anti-American counter reaction. So brothers and sisters, I think it's important for us to understand this, that whilst it's true, of course, that the US and her allies will not walk away from the Middle East, I think we need to understand that. They won't walk away from it. But what they have done has they have pulled back significantly their military presence by way of troops on the ground and even by way of weapons being supplied to the warring parties. There was a time when the Middle East was supremely under the influence of the Western powers. That is no longer the case today. The Western powers, principally led by the US, have pulled back significantly and into the vacuum has stepped Russia. And Russia is beginning to make her presence felt very strongly in Iran, in Iraq and in Syria. 
and who else and where else maybe they may impress people with their prowess. So we can see as the West is withdrawing, Russia is starting to come in, just as we would expect from Ezekiel 38, where Russia, together with Iran and other powers, will make that invasion into the land of Israel. But when we look at that slide there on the screen, perhaps we can see how that Russia has moved in where the West was once a force, and the West has lost much of its bite in the Middle East. Now, I like that cartoon because the bite is actually there down in the, the glass like a pair of false teeth. And uh, I haven't actually come to that stage yet of, of having false teeth, so I don't know what it's like. But, uh, you know, once you put your false teeth in the bottle, you haven't got much bite left. And that is really what has happened to the poor old Western countries. And perhaps, brothers and sisters, we can now better understand the weak Western response to Gog in Ezekiel 38. You know, have you come down to take a spoil, to take a prey? What are you doing here? The Ezekiel 38 does not present Russia as uh, uh, the US, I should say, and the Western powers as standing up in a very aggressive pose against the invasion by Gog. It's a weak response. And just as we're seeing that developing in the Middle East today, so we can better understand those words in Ezekiel 38. Now, what about Vladimir Putin? Well, in 2012, he was elected as the Russian president again for six years. Now, I say again because originally he was elected president in the year 2000 for a period of four years. And then under the constitution, he was allowed to have another four years. So he went through to 2008. Under the constitution, he then had to stand down. Well, he never intended to stand down. He always had his finger on the pulse. So he decided to put a stooge in place of himself, Mr. Medvedev. And Medvedev, who previously was the prime minister, became the president. And would you believe it? Vladimir Putin, who previously was the president, became the prime minister. Can you imagine what went on uh, between the two of them in the midnight hours? And there's no question whatsoever, as events have turned out, that Putin said to Medvedev, you hold the fort for four years, and then in 2012, I'll be back in the saddle. And in the meantime, he made sure that when he got back into the saddle, it would be for a longer period, because whereas the previous term of a president was just four years, when Putin came back into the role in 2012, the Russian constitution had been altered so that he could now stand for six years. So he's in there now until at least 2018. He can stand for two terms of six years. So theoretically, brothers and sisters, Vladimir Putin is there until 2024. And we've seen already what he has done since becoming president again, just in the last two years since 2012. What will happen over the next few years in the providence of God? So it's no wonder that the Russian people said, welcome back, Mr. President. Now, I'd just like to take you back in history a little moment to tell you what happened back just before the outbreak of the Second World War. In the Second World War, Nazi Germany was clamouring to take a chunk of Czechoslovakia. And they did so because they said that certain areas of Czechoslovakia, known as the Sudetenland, were occupied by German-speaking people. Although they were citizens and nationals of Czechoslovakia, Adolf Hitler said, but they are German-speaking people, and we want that territory. And Great Britain and France capitulated and allowed the German wolf to take some of that territory. And he said at the time, if I get this territory that I'm asking for, that's it. I have no more territorial dreams or desires. Ha ha. He took that in September 1938. In March 1939, he marched in and took over the whole country of Czechoslovakia. And six months later, the Second World War broke out. So, brothers and sisters, history is repeating itself. You've got now not the wolf, but you've got the Russian bear taking a chunk of a country. And what were the reasons given? Well, they're all Russian-speaking people. They live in Crimea, and although they are citizens of Ukraine, they should be citizens of Russia because they speak Russian. Well... It's almost the same as 1938 with Adolf Hitler. Let me show you these words from Charles Moore, 
uh, an important uh, commentator in the UK scene. Lessons from the 30s, that is during the time of Adolf Hitler, show us why we can't appease Vladimir Putin. Russia's leader is toying with the West and shows all the traits of a dictator on the march. European leaders in the 30s were woefully wrong in failing to understand what it means to be up against a dictator. And that error is being repeated today. And so whilst many commentators in the world perhaps are not seeing it so clearly, that commentator certainly is. And it reminds me again of some other words of Winston Churchill. Those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So Vladimir Putin has his sights set on further conquests. Look at those comments from the Australian just a day or two ago. In an emergency UN session on the growing crisis in Ukraine, members expressed outrage with US ambassadors saying Russia has manipulated, it has obfuscated, it has outright lied. Now in today's civilised society, when everyone at least outwardly is supposed to do the right thing, it came as a shock to people to think that the leader of a great nation such as Russia, a member of the United Nations, could so blatantly lie. But brothers and sisters, that is exactly what has happened. When Putin sat down for talks with Mr Poroshenko of Ukraine, he flatly denied that Russian forces had entered Ukraine. And he had been saying for months that Russia had nothing to do with the takeover of Crimea. Now he's come out and said, well, yes, we were involved in the takeover of Crimea. And now he's admitted that, yes, there are Russian troops in eastern Ukraine. Only a thousand of them, mind you, uh, besides the 20,000 sitting on the border. But, you know, he'd been saying for days that that wasn't the case. And the UN members are just astonished that someone could just outright lie. Well, what would we expect, as the scriptures outline for us? Now, here's a picture of Gog and his coalition. I know that this uh, projection is not too good from this projector, and uh, my tip to the school or to whoever supplied this projector is that they come and see the Brighton Ecclesia, because our, our projector is so good that it would have this uh, screen here blazing in light, you'd almost have to put your sunglasses on. So I apologise for the poor reflection here, but this is Magog, and included in the Magog territory is this territory here of Ukraine, Gog and his coalition. Now I'd like you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 38, and I'm going to read to you from the net version, just because it helps us to understand a little bit better what is happening to Russia as far as the scriptures are concerned. Ezekiel 38 and verse 4, and there it is on the screen, and I've headed it, Russia to change direction in the latter days. Now, as the net version puts it, I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and bring you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them fully armed, a great company with shields of different types, all of them armed with swords. I want you to notice that phrase there, I will turn you around. Now there may be a number of interpretations as to what that exactly means, and I'd welcome other discussion on that. But one of the things that really impresses me, brothers and sisters, is that that is exactly what has happened to Russia in the last 20 years or so, 25 years. You know, up until... 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia was a formidable power, not just in Europe, but worldwide. And older brothers and sisters here today will well remember the very tense times of the Cold War, when Russia and the US continued to try and outmatch each other by way of their nuclear weapons. But then came the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, and for the next 10 years, essentially, Russia went backwards. She was a second-rate power. Economically, militarily, in every sense of the war word, Russia was a nobody. And the Western powers thought that they had at last got the better of Russia. But they didn't bank on the scriptural record. And the scriptural record said, I will turn 
you around. And in the year 2000, Vladimir Putin came to power as the president. And we only have to now think of what has happened to Russia over the last 14 years since he came to power. There's been a dramatic change in the fortunes, literally fortunes, of Russia, but in another sense, in the fortunes of Russia by way of her military prowess and arrogance on the world scene. Thanks to Vladimir Putin, Russia is once again a force to be reckoned with. Under Putin, Russia has used its great reserves of oil and gas to rebuild its economy, its regional power and its global strategic influence. That's a turning around on a mammoth scale that perhaps we didn't see coming. This cartoon, I think, depicts it. There's the big bear. He's got the little rabbit in his hands. Of course I'm hungry. I've been hibernating since 1991 when the USSR collapsed. Now, in the meantime, brothers and sisters, do you know there's a remarkable thing happening in the Middle East, and that is this, that Russia is actually cozying up to Israel. Isn't that remarkable? We know from Scripture that at the time of the end, Russia will invade the Middle East, and in particular Israel. But right at this moment, the two countries are remarkably close. Very friendly, in fact. Putin said in a recent meeting with rabbis in Moscow, I support the struggle of Israel. And he's referring particularly to the struggle that Israel was having with the Palestinians led by the Hamas faction. He said, I support your struggle. I follow closely what's going on in Israel, said Putin, during a long meeting with Jewish rabbis held in Moscow. And just a few months ago, a meeting was held in Moscow between Vladimir Putin and the Prime Minister of Israel, Mr Netanyahu. Let's read what occurred. In a recent meeting, a pact was forged between Moscow and Jerusalem to ensure Israel's security. Putin made it clear to Netanyahu that Russia will not do anything to harm Israel. Russia would stand by Israel's side and offer aid in the event of a conflict against it. Now, you might think those comments are laughable in the light of what we know from Ezekiel 38. But, brothers and sisters, what we have to bear in mind is this. You know from Ezekiel 38 that Gog invades Israel at a time when she dwells safely, when she feels secure, when she feels as though she hasn't got much going on around her borders. Now, could it be that these assurances coming from Russia together with Russian involvement in the broader Middle Eastern sphere, such as attempting to control the IS caliphate forces in Iraq and Syria, also Russia's influence in Iran, we could well get to the situation where Russia may be looked upon as being the power in the Middle East that is bringing a sense of security and safety to the powers, including Israel. And Israel is being sucked into a false sense of security. She's thinking that by cozying up to Russia, she will be secure. But you know, as I've put there on the screen, she's making the same mistake that Hezekiah first did when Sennacherib came down to invade the land of Israel. You may recall how Hezekiah, in a moment of weakness, tried to pay off the Assyrian armies. He raised the tribute money, gave it to the Assyrians and said, Here's a gift, now leave me alone. And the Assyrians said, thanks for the gift, but we're not leaving you alone. And they invaded anyway. And then Hezekiah came to the fore in a magnificent display of faith. But on this occasion, the Israelis are going to be sucked in by the peace and safety cry, and they will not learn their lesson until they accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. So on one hand, Russia is cozying up to Israel. But, you know, one of the fundamental features of Russia and Vladimir Putin in particular is this aspect of deceit. There's a headline cover of the recent Economist magazine entitled A Web of Lies. Deceit is standard operating procedure for Putin. And another commentator said this, 
By the time the international community reached the conclusion that you lied, you and your allies will be so far ahead of the game that it will not matter. James Miller, a Russian expert and managing editor of the Interpreter magazine. And I think, brothers and sisters, we are seeing that happening. Vladimir Putin has lied extensively over the Crimean and the broader Ukraine situation. Is that the end of the lies from the Russians? By no means. They will continue to operate in that manner until eventually the world will be taken by surprise before the outbreak of Armageddon. Let Israel beware. The latter-day Haman will also strike. For Haman, the son of Hamadatha, of the kindred of Agag, the enemy and adversary of Jews, thought evil against them, to slay them and to do them away. Is that Ezekiel 38 language? It's almost word for word, isn't it? And it's most interesting in that wonderful prophecy in uh, Numbers 24, Agag is actually translated as Gog in the Septuagint version. So what's going to happen? Well, God has baited the hook. We read in Ezekiel 38, I will put hooks into thy jaws and I will bring thee forth. So whatever the scene is today, brothers and sisters, whatever peace overtures are coming out now between Israel and Russia, we know for sure that the time is coming when Russia will be dragged down into the Middle East. Something will entice her to take a spoil and to take a prey. We could argue that it is oil or gas, but whatever it is, something is going to draw Russia down into the Middle East as part of the providence of Yahweh to bring about his judgments upon the nation because of their evil, wicked desire to destroy God's people. And this aspect of drawing go down and drawing the nations down in the Middle East figures quite prominently in the scriptures. Gog and the nations are brought forth into Israel. I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And he gathered them into a Hebrew place, a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And what is the target? After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So at a time when Israel is feeling secure, dwelling securely, at peace possibly with her neighbours, that is the time when the latter-day Haman will strike. Now we've just read those words of Haman. What about in Ezekiel 38? Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey. That's the desire. They're the words of Isaiah 10. Russia's desire to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. There's no question that the turning around of Gog, as predicted in the scriptures, has started and it will not finish until Russia invades the land of Israel. Now, I think it's most interesting to note, brothers and sisters, that there will be a religious dimension to the invasion of Israel. Do you know that Vladimir Putin is a very deeply religious man? He's the first Kremlin leader since the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution to publicly profess faith in the Orthodox Church. Now, isn't that incredibly significant? Not since the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, when the, the ruling power, the Tsars and the Church effectively were overthrown, has a Russian leader publicly professed his religion strongly as orthodox. He has no shame about that. He's quite open in professing his belief in the orthodox religion. He gets on well with the current Pope. Forbes magazine, a very influential business magazine, every year 
puts out a list of the most powerful people. And in 2013, number four was Pope Francis. And here he is meeting number one, Vladimir Putin, at the Vatican. What is happening is this. Mr Putin is fostering deliberately relations with the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic powers because he can see that it is to the benefit of Russia and to the Russian leaders in particular to have the church on their side. Now I'm going to put on the screen for you uh, um, rather lengthy comments but I think it's important for us just to read these to ascertain what is going on between Russia and the church. This is written by a political columnist, Mr Massimo Franco. The Russian Papal Alliance in the Mideast. What has brought Russia's Putin and Pope Francis together? Here are the reasons. A pragmatic approach of the Holy See when it comes to international relations. And that has happened right through their history. The Vatican has no troops. The Pope badly needs a world power that can be a defender of Christians. Russia is active in the Middle East and has influence and hard power. Putin, never a man to miss an opportunity for a power play, decided to protect not just Orthodox Christians, such as Russian and Greek, but also Catholics in the Arab world. There is a converging interest between Orthodox Russians and Papal Rome, not just on the Middle East question, but also on the so-called moral values. The church actually looks to Vladimir Putin as the upholder of traditional Roman Catholic Christian values. They value his position as a world leader. The Vatican-Russia alliance is due to continue in the Middle East. It will last at least as long as the West refuses to view the major changes happening in some of the most tormented areas of the world with both strategic clarity and urgency. Now, I thought that was a really eye-opener of an article because that writer could see clearly what is going on between Russia and the church. Russia sees it's in her interests to develop these close relations because the church and the state combined can achieve wonders. Let's look at some words of Brother Thomas written many, many decades ago under the heading, When Russia Grabs Turkey, taken from the prophecy of Daniel. When therefore the Tsar, that is Gog, gets possession of Constantinople, Istanbul in Turkey today, he will not be hostile to the Pope. On the contrary, he will honour and acknowledge him and as a consequence be the enemy of the Holy Land. Now, why would the church be so interested in the Holy Land? Well, of course, it's the birthplace of Jesus Christ. But, you know, there is a tremendous amount of real estate owned by the Russian Orthodox Church in Israel. Those pictures there outline some of the magnificent sites, S-I-T-E-S, that is, of the church in Israel. And what did the scriptures say? Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for a holy war. Call out the warriors. Let all those fighting men approach and attack Beat your ploughshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say, I too am a warrior. You see, when Go comes down to the Middle East, it won't be just from a political perspective. He will have the church on his side because the church for centuries has always dearly wanted to take control of those sacred sites in Jerusalem. And of course we know from an historical perspective how anti-Semitic the church has been towards the Jewish people. Some more words now from Brother Thomas, from his exposition of Daniel. The prophecy concerning the king in Daniel 8.25 gives a hint of its future ecclesiastical peculiarity as appears from the testimony that through his policy he shall cause falsehood to prosper by his power. Now, falsehood is Brother Thomas's translation of the Greek. In the King James Version, it is translated as craft. But in Strong's Concordance, we find that the original meaning of the Hebrew is deceit, subtlety, treachery. So I have it there on the screen. A web of lies. And when the 
Malaysian MH17 was shot down in Malaysia, well, who do you blame? You don't blame the Russian separatists. You don't blame the rebels. You blame the Ukraine government. The state on whose territory this happened is responsible for this awful tragedy. Daniel 8.25 says that through his policy, he shall cause deceit to prosper by his power. As the head of a confederacy of the adherents of the Greek and Latin churches, it will be his policy to cause their priesthoods to be respected as useful cooperators in the subjection of Europe to his will. And no wonder we could describe the invasion of the Middle East as a jihad. Not from a Muslim perspective, but rather using the word in the broader sense of a religious holy war against Israel. Proclaim this among the nations, consecrate, make holy for war. Now remember that slide I showed you a little while back when uh, after Adolf Hitler had taken that chunk of Czechoslovakia in September 1938, six months later he took over the whole country, six months after that there was World War II. Well now we have that pattern replicated in the scriptures as far as Gog is concerned. In the prophecy of Daniel, we have another blitzkrieg. When the German forces charged into Poland on the 1st of September 1939, they came with such ferocity and speed that the word was coined, it was a blitzkrieg. It was just a lightning advance, and the Polish forces were overthrown almost overnight. Well, what happened in 1939, brothers and sisters, is going to happen again. We read that the invasion of Israel by Gog is predicted by other prophets. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel? So it's not just Ezekiel we're going to be looking at, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. So he is one of those prophets. Israel and the West are caught off guard. The Western powers, reluctant to take on Russia, crawl back into their quietness, thinking that all the troubles will go away. And then suddenly, without warning... Gog's invasion will be swift and brutal, a blitzkrieg. At the time of the end, the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. He shall advance over against countries and pass through like a flood, just like the Assyrians did in the days of Hezekiah. He shall come into the beautiful land and tens of thousands shall fall victim. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver and all the riches of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow in his train. That's Isaiah 10 all over again. His desire to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. And speaking of Isaiah 10, let's read those words now, this time taken from the NIV. Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against a people who anger me to seize loot and to snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. But this is not what he intends. This is not what he has in mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations. And what the prophet is telling us here is is that because of the wickedness of God's people in the land today, and the bulk of them are godless, I read a book only recently called My Promised Land, written by a well-known Jewish author. And amongst other things, he points out that the morality of Israel is really right down the bottom. The lifestyle of the Israelis, particularly in the city of Tel Aviv, would be as bad as any corrupt city in this world. And it's no wonder, brothers and sisters, therefore, that the prophet describes the way in which God will use the foreign powers such as Gog to come into the land to bring judgments upon his people, to cause them to turn again to their Messiah. So he allows Gog to come down. He allows Gog to bring judgments upon his people. But in the process, Gog goes too far. And that's what is meant when we read that this is not what he intends. His intentions is not just to bring judgments, God's judgments upon the nation. His intention is to destroy 
and have put an end to many nations. In the Australian paper, only a few weeks ago, there was a most interesting article. Now, I've said that word probably a few times a day, but uh, it is. Now, a bit lengthy, but let's just read it. I've headed it, An Evil Thought. What is going on in the Kremlin? What is President Vladimir Putin thinking? There's a man called Alexander, and that's not a spelling mistake. There's no E between the D and R. Alexander Dugin. He's an advisor to Vladimir Putin's United Russia Party. He describes how Russia should use its oil and gas to, to intimidate countries. He advocates ideological warfare, disinformation, demoralisation, destabilisation, subversion and insurgency with special forces, sponsored militias and other covert services in the vanguard. Can you think of a country that's caught that? Ukraine stands out like a beacon. In his book, The End of the World, Dugin says, unwittingly not knowing that he's effectively citing scripture, this is the divine destiny of Russia. Through the Russian people will be realised the last thought of God, the thought of the end of the world. Dugin seeks the mobilisation of the peoples of Eurasia, led by Russia, including the former Soviet republics, Germany, Central and Eastern Europe, Turkey and Iran, to subdue the world. A fascinating article spells out what we brothers and sisters are so privileged to know. So he sets out to destroy death and destruction planned for the Jewish, Jewish people, just like the Assyrians wanted to, what Haman wanted to, what Hitler wanted to do. But what happens? Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. And what a fitting end to a power that attempts to destroy the people of God. And Isaiah 10 brings it all to a conclusion for us. When Yahweh has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, when he's finished humbling the nation and they accept their Messiah, he will punish the arrogant boasting of the king of Assyria and his haughty pride. On that day, the remnant of Israel, and it's no question it's referring to our times because the words are quoted by Paul in Romans 9, referring to the last times. On that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob, for example, like Netanyahu, will no longer lean on the one, Russia, who struck them, but will lean on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. And so when we saw that picture of uh, the leader of Soviet Russia, leader of Russia, Vladimir Putin, sitting down with Netanyahu and saying, I'm on your side, we will do nothing to bring peril into your land, they will come to realise how foolish they've been to turn their backs on their saviour, Yahweh in heaven and his son. And they will no longer lean on the, the godless powers of today who struck them, but they will lean on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. When these things, brothers and sisters, begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. And that was going to be my last slide, but I thought I'd better put this one up because... There's a big town hall lecture coming up on the 14th of October in the Adelaide Town Hall, 7.30pm, a one-hour presentation, bring along a friend. And, uh, you know, if we had thought when we were planning this lecture at the beginning of the year that we would have had what's going on in the papers today, we would have been so excited. Well, we are excited because what is happening today is one of the best sort of lead-ups to a public lecture we could ever have. Let's see you all there. Thank you.